Thank you, praise team, for leading us in worship. Thank you so much. Good morning. Good to see you. I hope everyone is doing well. I hope you had a good week. Years ago, back in the 60s and early 70s, every summer, our family would take a vacation. And because my grandparents lived in Daytona Beach, technically Ormond Beach, we would come to Florida, whether we were living in Mississippi or or if we were in South Florida, we would travel up to Central Florida. Some of the day trips where we uh, traveled might be familiar to you. We would travel to to St. Augustine. We'd also travel to De Leon Springs, and Blue Springs, maybe over to St. Petersburg. One of the things that was interesting to me as a boy on vacation when we would take these excursions would be some of the, the places that were fascinating. How many of you have been to the Fountain of Youth in St. Augustine? All right, I see those hands. How many of you were disappointed when you went to the Fountain of Youth? Exactly right. And the same is true with De Leon Springs. If you know De Leon Springs, it is known for a certain pancake restaurant, not necessarily the swimming area. Are you with me on that? Yes, I've, I'm disappointed in De Leon Springs because I could never get into the restaurant because the lines were so long to get into that restaurant. Did you know that there is a fountain of youth over in St. Petersburg? How many of you have been there? I haven't. Uh, Not too popular. I think it's overgrown now. What is interesting is that these different attractions and the folklore that is identified with that uh, is is quite trivial, quite interesting if you're uh, wondering about about youthfulness and eternal life. Well, what I want us to take a look at and hopefully answer this question is, what is the living water? What is the living water? Well, we're going to look at that in John chapter 4. And before we dig into that, I want to ask you if you'll join me in a word of prayer. So let's pray together. Father, we come to you and we thank you for this time that we're gathered together. We thank you for working in our lives. But yet right now, Father, we ask that you would help us to be still, to let your Holy Spirit work with us so that we understand your word. Father, we ask that you would help us to see you and you only. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So many of you will associate this situation that happened in Scripture with the woman at the well. So as we study the woman at the well, I want us to focus not necessarily as much on this woman, but the essence of living water. So we're going to look at John chapter 4, and I want to make sure that we understand the setting here. Towards the beginning of John chapter 4, there's a transition in Jesus' ministry. And so in verse 3 and 4 through 6, I want us to see the setting. So take a look at John chapter 4, verses 3 and following as I give this setting to you. He left Judea, talking about Jesus, and departed again for Galilee. So Jesus with the disciples were traveling back to Galilee. Verse 4, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. So here's the setting. As Jesus was traveling back to Galilee, they went into a different cultural location. Samaria. And where they went was to a town, and outside of that town was a very historical place. It is known as Jacob's Well. Now, I have, I think, here a picture. This was taken uh, back in the 1800s in what is close to what is Jacob's Well. Gives us an understanding. Now, you see in this picture the, the ladies that are there, but in this setting, in this setting, You'll see, Scripture says, it was about the sixth hour. So as Jesus was traveling, it was about 12 noon, midday, when he came to this well. And he was weary from traveling. Now, what does that say to me? Jesus was completely human. He had fatigue. He would get tired. Completely God, but he was also human. So as he's there, a couple of things that come to my mind. He's traveling in a 
in a location that is not necessarily friendly to Jewish folk. The Samaritans and the Jewish folk really didn't get along, just so that we understand that. So he's not in his own backyard, if you will. So that's the setting. It's about 12 o'clock noon, and he's tired. So that's the, that's the, the setting, if you will. So let's take a look at what happens with the request that Jesus gave. Look at verses 7 through 9. In our first point, we're going to uh, see what the request is. Verse 7 says, A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Now, remember that I said it was about noon. What I understand from several uh, different commentaries is that normally the ladies would go to the well first thing in the morning, not at midday, because it was so hot. So why is it, this is just uh, wondering, if you will, why is it that this one woman came to the well at midday? Well, the theory is that she had a bad reputation, and so she could not associate with the women that would come first thing in the morning. That's just one theory. So it wasn't as though there were a bunch of women drawing water from this well. So she comes, it's about noon, and she approaches Jesus. All right. What does Jesus say to her? Give me a drink. Give me a drink. Now look at verse 8. For the disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The lady responds to Jesus and said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? What I want you to see is the request is that of Jesus to the woman. And what this shows me is that the ministry of Jesus was not isolated just to Jews. Christ's ministry, his fulfillment, was for everyone. We see this in that he crossed the cultural boundary to reach this Samaritan woman. What does that say to us? God calls us to love and to reach everyone. When you think of the state of Florida, if I can illustrate it this way, how many regions would you identify? We are in what used to be called the Citrus Belt or the I-4 corridor. I grew up in South Florida, vastly different than here. Would you agree? And then in the Panhandle, a lot of folk call that area L.A., Lower Alabama. All right, some people knew that. All right. So I'm illustrating a situation in that where you are accustomed to might be challenging if you are trying to assimilate in a different location. Wednesday night, somebody said to me, well, you moved from Mississippi, you don't have an accent. And I said, because when we moved, I lost that accent on purpose. I was nine years old, and I got teased in elementary school because of my southern twang, if you will. I'm illustrating the situation. Jesus was not in his cultural setting. He went beyond that. Is God calling you to look beyond your comfort zone to reach out to everyone? I challenge you with that. Don't stay in just your comfort zone in your culture. Jesus showed us how we need to go beyond those boundaries. So what was the request? Jesus asked for some water. But more importantly, Jesus went out of his cultural boundary. The second thing that I want us to see is verses 10 through 15, the gift from God. So follow along as I, as I read verse 10 and following. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well here is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. 
that water, the water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Now, face value, let's talk about wells. And, and I'm, I have some experience with wells because we live out east and we live on well water. And so when a hurricane comes and one was, is without electricity, we don't have any water. So we crank up the generator and I run the, the electrical line into my well pump so that we can have water as such. Not just that, the water that we have at our place doesn't spray and show rust on the walls because that's significant. What I understand is based on the depth of your well will determine the type of water that you receive. So she, the woman here, is questioning Jesus about the water that he's going to give her. Why? He doesn't have a bucket. And this well was real deep. It is quite puzzling to her what he means by living water. And quite puzzling to me when I was in uh, middle school. When I was in middle school, my dad was pastor of Pembroke Road Baptist Church. And I was part of the youth group at Pembroke Road Baptist Church. And on Sunday nights, before we had training union, we had youth choir rehearsal. And so the youth choir would sing in the Sunday night service. Those were long days. I've just got to be real with you. We'd have Sunday school, Sunday worship, youth choir practice, training union, and then Sunday evening service. And we, had, we wore uh, the same outfits. Well, when we got done with choir rehearsal, I would go out into the back area close to where the library was, and there was a water fountain there at Pembroke Road Baptist Church. And as I was drinking from that water, every time I would look up and there was a placard that would quote this verse. Now, if it's hot and you're thirsty and you read that, you're thinking, well, it would be nice not to just be thirsty again. And so she's asking this question, what do you mean? Well, here's a clue. Here's a clue. Turn, if you will, to chapter 7 of the same book, John chapter 7 verses 37 through 39. Verses 37 through 39, we're going to get an answer to this question about living water. Okay, chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. <coughs> Excuse me. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Verse 39. Now this he said about the Spirit. Notice there is a capital S. This he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So what does this mean? Both of these passages is where Jesus is talking about living water, and he is identifying the Holy Spirit. Here's the thing. Sometimes people associate living water with salvation. Not necessarily so. The living water that Jesus is identifying is the Holy Spirit in the believer's life. What does that mean? It means the gift from God is the Holy Spirit. What it means for us is that when the Holy Spirit is in control of our lives, we are satisfied. Now, how are we satisfied? Simply put, when I surrender to the Holy Spirit, he works in me and my desires are his desires. And so I'm not craving something else. Now, let me look at it at a different angle. If I'm worried about something then I want something to satisfy that. I need to back up and surrender so that the Holy Spirit takes control. That way I don't worry. When I'm craving something materialistic, hello? Just kidding, just kidding. When I'm craving something materialistic, I need to back up 
and ask the Holy Spirit, take control so that I don't crave that, so that I am content in him. That's what Jesus means by never thirsting again. So if you're dealing with craving something that is not of God, it's time to pause and ask God to take control, whether it's worry, whether it's greed, whether it's control issues, whether it's lust, whether it is uh, uh, notoriety, whatever the temptation, it's time to back up, surrender to the Holy Spirit so that then our complete satisfaction is in him. That's the living water. That is the living water. Now let's look at the consequence. When Jesus talks about the living water, the Samaritan woman is sort of confused. All right? Sometimes when we talk about living water, there might be a little bit of confusion and something needs to take place before the Holy Spirit's control. So we're going to see this illustration that Christ gives. Look at verses 16 through 19 of chapter 4. 16 through 19 of chapter 4. Jesus said to her, all right, she's saying, you don't have a way to draw water, all right? So Jesus answers this way in verse 16. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. Simple question, call your husband and come here. Verse 17, the woman answered, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. Uh, I don't know if this lady's name was Elizabeth Taylor or what. But it's a situation that she says, I have no husband, and Jesus, in essence, says, gotcha. What happens is that this woman, by the word of Jesus, was convicted was convicted. She realized when Jesus spoke this truth that she was guilty. All right? Um, the woman in verse 19 said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Simply put, you think so? That's, that might be an understatement. More than a prophet, we're dealing with the Messiah. All right, and so what she does is she goes back to her cultural uh, thoughts and the way that she was raised, and we'll look at that later, but she realizes her state and realizes that this is a prophet. Now, here's what I'm suggesting to you. The consequence for us is conviction. What I mean is this. If we're wanting to be satisfied, if we're wanting to uh, be uh, fully satisfied, content, without thirst, we first must do business with God, if I could put it an old-fashioned way. We must ask God to reveal to us any unconfessed sin. Jesus revealed to this woman the sin in her life. For you and I, if we are wanting God's control, it starts with confession and asking the Holy Spirit to reveal to us any unconfessed sin. What that means is if, if we're dealing with uh, a certain area, we struggle in a certain area, we need to confess that sin, repent, which, which means change directions, and then the Holy Spirit will work in our lives. And then we'll be satisfied. So what happens here is that this woman was convicted. All right? That was the consequence, was conviction of unconfessed sin. Now, she defaults back to her cultural background, verses 20 and following. So look at verses 20 and following. All right? She says, I perceive that you're a prophet. Verse 20, our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is a place where people ought to worship. Let me refresh your memory about the culture here. Samaritans, they worshipped their God, the God of Jacob, in that location on that mountain. And she associated Jesus as being Jewish and so defaulted to where Jewish people worshipped, which was in Jerusalem. 
She talked about the place where she worships and the place where she thought Jesus worshipped, all right? But what I suggest to you is not the location, but how. It's, worship is not about the location. The worship is about the how. How do you worship? How do I worship? It's not so much about the method. It's about the object of worship. So let me ask you, who is the object of worship? Tell me out loud. Who is, the, who is our object of worship? Somebody say Jesus, please. All right, everybody say Jesus. That's our object. It's not because we're in this room. This room enables us to worship King Jesus. But the same King Jesus is who you worship in your private place, in the closet or in your living room or as you're kneeling by your bed. It's not about the location. It's about the object. It's not so much about the method because as the Holy Spirit carries you along, as you are filled with the Holy Spirit, then your method of worship will be pleasing to God. And so here was the challenge. This lady thought that she could only worship in that one location, and she associated Jewish people with only being able to worship in Jerusalem. For you and I, as the Holy Spirit is working in our lives, the way we live, we will be worshiping the object, King Jesus. So the, the important thing for us to think about is the place of worship. The place of worship, you can write this down, it's not where, but it's how. I suggest to you, effective worship starts with a clean heart, as I mentioned to you before. Confession, because of conviction, repentance, and then as the Holy Spirit takes control, then we can have effective communion, community, koinonia, fellowship with God, worshiping him all right continuing on continuing on we're going to look at the, at the results in verses uh 28 and following okay let's look at uh now let's continue let's continue in verse 21 jesus said to her woman believe me the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in jerusalem all right so he confronts her her statement will you worship the father you worship what you do not know we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. Let me make sure we understand this. Jesus is saying to the woman, you're worshiping what you don't know. We worship what we know because salvation is from the Jews. What Jesus was specifying here is that God used the nation of Israel as a channel of blessing. Prophecy was all about Israel bringing the Messiah. Salvation started through the Jews because of Jesus Christ and his incarnation and the work that he did. That's what that verse means. Verse 23, but the hour is coming and now is here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. See, this emphasizes, this underlines, underscores, this is the basis for what we're talking about, Jesus being the object when Jesus said we must worship in spirit and in truth, the word spirit literally means breath. So as we worship, it's as though the breath inside of us is, communi is communing with God. That's what spirit, the word pneuma, means. It's our breath. And as we worship in breath, in spirit, and in truth, our worship must be consistent must never deviate from God's truth from God's word anyone who emphasizes that the way they worship is 
in contrast or contradicts Scripture that is false, that is wrong. So the way we worship must never violate God's Word. So as we worship in spirit, our, our, our breathing, if you will, our living with, our surrendering of ourselves, and as we worship in truth, meaning consistently with God's word and with God, then we have effective worship. Not based on where, but how. All right, continuing on, continuing on. Let's take a look at verses 28 and following, the results of, of this experience, okay? So the woman left her water jar. She left her water jar. Why? I think because she was challenged and she was excited. She was overwhelmed, if you will. All right, verse 28. She left her water jar and went away into the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Now skip down to verse 39. Skip down to verse 39 and following. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. Bear in mind the cultural contrast here. So he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard our, for ourselves. And we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. So what was the results of the testimony? It was the outflow of the Holy Spirit. Her testimony about Jesus resulted in other people being curious, and then they came to Jesus, they listened to him, and then they believed in him. So that testimony that she gave resulted in the working of the Holy Spirit in that community, in that community that was outside their normal boundaries. The working of the Holy Spirit in which many folk from that community came to Jesus. So what happens when you and I are living through the work of the Holy Spirit? The result is that you and I will be a testimony to other folk so that then they, because of your words and sometimes more importantly, your actions, will bring them not only to Jesus, but will bring them to maturity in Jesus. The work of the Holy Spirit simply means more folk will come to Jesus. Is that happening in your life? Or might there be distractions? Might it be a situation that we're not satisfied with the living water? If we cannot see God working in our lives, we might need to pause. We might need to ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us and reveal to us if there is anything that is keeping us from surrendering, walking in Him, being satisfied with the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And as a result, then, we can be effective for Jesus. So here's some takeaways. What are the opportunities that you have in which you can share to others? We see how Jesus crossed the cultural boundaries. Are there opportunities in your life in which you can share about Jesus? It might be a situation in that you go outside the normal boundaries of your culture. Second takeaway that I want you to see. Should we ask for conviction prior to asking the Holy Spirit to quench our thirst? Yes. Yes. Because it's all about surrender. It's not about what I want. And so if I need to make myself clean by the work of the Holy Spirit and then through the blood of Jesus Christ, that is important. That is important. It comes down to who is the most important thing, me or God. And it's God. It's all about surrender. It's all about surrender. The third takeaway is this question. 
What is worship in spirit and truth? For us, worship literally means that we, by the working of the Holy Spirit, are breathing, living, communing, engaging, walking with God. And that worship never, never violates God's word. It is consistent with God's word. It's not based on an emotion. It's based on truth. You see, we have more than just God the Father and Jesus Christ that saved us. We have the Holy Spirit that can empower us, that can help us to understand God's word, that can guide us, that equips us, that works through us so that other people understand and can come to Jesus. So what is the, Holy, what is the living water? I suggest to you it's the Holy Spirit working through and there's an outflow of him to others. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you and we thank you for this this truth, this situation that actually happened, and more importantly, the responsibility that we have to surrender to you, to trust the re- revealing work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We thank you for this time in which we can be with you, not just in this room, but each and every day throughout the day. Father, I ask that you would work now to help us not just to remember this passage. But Lord, help us to to walk in regards to your desires. Help us to surrender to you. Help us to uh, trust you in each and every situation. Lord, help us to not be distracted with the challenges that come our way. Father, help us to reach beyond the boundaries of of, uh, our comfort zone. Lord, we ask that you would work in this body so that Parkland will see your desires about the days ahead in loving the people in this community, but also those beyond this community and throughout the world. As we continue to worship, Lord, we ask that you would work right now. In Christ's name, amen.